بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الله سبحانه وتعالى he tells us in the Quran اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا الله سبحانه وتعالى says in his glorious words today I have perfected for you your religion and I have completed upon you my favor and I have chosen for you and been pleased for you Islam as a way of life so what did Allah mention in this verse as a favor to us that he has perfected for us this way of life as Islam a favor a blessing a bounty but the problem is that many a time when we live life we have a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't know how to appreciate that gift for many reasons one maybe we're not living the moment of the gift that we have been given wherever that be two it may be that we are ignorant of the gift that we have been given we haven't pondered about it we haven't thought about it we haven't looked into it three maybe we're just so busy we're busy with small things in life that we forget about the major gifts that are free to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the greatest of gifts, as we came to know in this uh, verse, where Allah says, I have perfected for you my favor. This favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with, the favor of Islam. This is the greatest gift that anybody can receive on the face of this earth, in the existence of this universe. But how are we pertaining and in relation to this gift? Are we from those who truly understand its value? Are we from those who are unaware of its value? And that is the case of many of us, most of us. If you look into our lives, I don't say yours because I'm suffering from the same thing. If you look into our lives, the amount of time we spend surfing the internet, the amount of time we spend in conversations, the amount of time we spend in activities in the gym, etc., on YouTube, we have so much time for everything. But when it comes to Islam and learning about Islam and trying to implement Islam to a higher level and better level, most of us would say we don't have time. It's too, we're too busy. The masjid with the classes is too far. Even I'm thinking that as I'm coming to give the lecture. The masjid is quite far. Shaitan whispers to all of us. So how then are we to be able to appreciate the bounty of Islam if we're not spending enough time in the religion of Islam. Because as you know, most of us, we pray the five daily prayers, we read some Quran, but the rest of the day, where is it? Are we pondering upon Islam? Are we learning about Islam? Are we trying to improve ourselves? The answer, obviously, if we are truthful to ourselves, would be no. So then I say to you, if that is the reality of our situation, how do we value then this bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us? Truly, we're not aware of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. If we were truly aware, this would not be our situation. Our situation would be one of addiction. We would be addicted to Islam. Those people who are righteous, and you come across them from time to time, to us, we look upon them as, this guy's a bit strange. We may even say he's extreme, because all he ever does is think and talk and live Islam. The things that we take as in our minds, as being minor infractions. You know, we commit a sin. We say, you know, it's not such a big one. But to that righteous person, it's something which is horrific. He's thinking, how could you do that? Why is that situation with the righteous person? Because he's living Islam. He's fully understanding the bounty of Islam. But us, many of us, we're not giving that time, the emotion, the thought, and that's why we're not at that level of being fully committed and fully understanding this bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So of course the more we learn, and we've mentioned this time and time again, that the more we learn Islam, the more our appreciation of this bounty will be. And that's what Allah says in the Quran. Allah raises those from amongst you who number one believe and then they have been given knowledge. He raises them in ranks. So the more you have knowledge, the more your belief will increase. The more your belief increases, the more your knowledge increases, 
and therefore you are raised in rank and you come to understand more the bounty of Islam. And as the Prophet said in the hadith uh, collected by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, Man bihi khair, fi deen. The one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for, he gives him understanding of the religion. And now this understanding of the religion and this knowledge that I'm talking about, it's not just information. It's rather the more you learn about Islam, the more you become a person who ponders and thinks and reflects. Those righteous people, they're always thinking. They're always looking into the signs of Allah in the creation and in the books that Allah has revealed in the knowledge. They're always pondering and always reflecting upon the bounties that Allah has given them. And then they become amazed. They literally are astounded that me, I'm so not deserving of this favor. I'm so not deserving of this bounty of Islam. And then they worship Allah more and they fall in love with Allah more because they appreciate what they have been given. But again, this only comes about for those who actually seek the knowledge and ponder and give time to be influenced by the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because without a shadow of a doubt, without any doubt whatsoever, the reality of this world is that it's a place, it's a battlefield of influences. Moment by moment, day by day, you are being influenced. It's either shaitan is influencing you and his way, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is influencing you and the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no third. You are either being influenced by the revelation of Allah azawajal, or you are by being influenced by the whisperings, the plots, and the mechanisms of shaitan and his way. So the more you spend time learning about Islam, the more you spend time reading about Islam, the more you spend time reflecting about Islam, the more you spend time being with righteous people, good people, what happens to you? Your influence of good increases. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, A person is upon the religion of his friend. So be extremely careful to who you take as your friend. You may be the most intelligent person, but you hang around with fools, you're soon going to become foolish. You may be a righteous person, but you hang around with juhal, with people who are ignorant of the religion. Soon you are going to start losing your religion bit by bit. So the point is that this world is a place of influences and we have to be careful and all the time reflect what is influencing me. So the point of this lecture as I started, mentioning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has considered Islam for us a bounty for him. A mercy, a bounty, a favor. And for us to truly understand this favor, we need to reflect more. And the reflection comes about not just by reading the Quran, but by pondering often. Pondering upon the creation and also pondering upon what Allah has given us as compared to those who do not have it. So every time you find something in Islam, a guidance, you should think to yourself, how would my life be without this guidance? How would my life be without this particular instruction? Because then that way you come to realize after looking at those who do not have it, how blessed you are. And the bounty for you will increase in its magnitude and in, in its, in its worth. So this is what we need to do often and this is what I've put together a few thoughts regarding some of the bounties contained within Islam. And of course there's thousands upon thousands. The first thought, many a time I've sat in discussions with people, whether it be at work or outside of work, and you find people, they tend to go on about and bang on about how great the West is and how civilized they are and how forward thinking they are and how technologically advanced they are and how somehow backward the Muslims are. There's truth in that. In the West, you find many good things, many things which are beneficial. You find many people who are beneficial and good people. Good, they don't have deen, but good in terms of the way they think. Humanists, maybe. And sometimes you don't find the same type of people in the Muslim lands. But the reality is that if you don't look at the world through the lens of the Quran and the Sunnah, the lens of the Quran and the Sunnah, you won't be able to distinguish really in the world who are the good people and who are the evil people. So you find, for example, the same society that people keep banging on about, saying how great they are, 
who are the ones who are spreading the weapons of mass destruction? Who are the ones who are going through the lands, their governments, and spreading corruption? And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about them in the Quran? وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Allah says in the early verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, and if it's said to them, do not spread corruption upon the earth, what do they say? They stand up with their flags and they proudly say, no, we are the people who spread peace and justice in the earth. But Allah says, no, verily they are the transgressors. They are the ones who spread corruption, but they do not realize what they are doing. Meaning they are so deeply involved in the corruption that they're spreading, they don't even recognize it anymore. So look how the Quran identifies for you the reality of the world, the reality of what is taking place. But if you weren't to have this knowledge, and if you weren't to be considering and reflecting, you wouldn't be able to recognize this. You would be from those whose iman is weak, and they rush with that statement, yes, everything about the West is great, and everything about the East is corrupt and wrong. But that's not the reality that Allah tells us in the Quran. If we don't look through the lenses, as I said, of the Quran and the Sunnah, we become misguided and become lost. If our information is only from the news outlets of the Western media, then we won't be able to distinguish truth from falsehood. But from the bounty of Islam is that it's given us a moral compass. Allah has given us much information about those who cause corruption on the earth. And much information given to us through the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, about times when there would be corruption. The Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith, narrated or collected in the Sunnah of Ibn Majah, Abu Huraira anhu said that the Prophet وسلم, said, there will come upon you years of treachery where the liars will be believed and the truthful will be taken as liars. They will be denied the truthful people and the deceitful people and the ones of little character, they will be the ones who are trusted. And the Ruwaybida will deliver speeches. It was said to the Prophet Sallallahu who, who are these Ruwaybida, Ya Rasulullah? He said, it is the people that are of small mind, foolish, but they will be there speaking about the important matters of people. And in some narrations, they will be in charge of the affairs of the people. So look how Islam makes things clear for you. Today, what do we see? Many of the leaders of the great powers of the world, what are the state of their minds? Are they not as the Prophet described? That they are the liars, they are the ones who are untrustworthy, they are the ones who are small of mind in the way they behave and speak, yet they are in charge. But because the Muslims have this information, if they reflect upon it, they're able to navigate the moral compass of this world. They're able to understand who are the people of truth and who are the people of falsehood. But if you don't have this information and you don't reflect upon it, you'll be swayed and not be able to understand what is truth and what is falsehood. Another reflection about the bounties of Islam. Today, in our societies, you find that many young people, and even some of those who have a middle age life crisis, many young people, they are depressed. Why are they depressed? Because society is dictating to them how they should be, how they should look, how they should talk, how they should behave. So they are told by the fashion gurus that you have to dress in this particular manner. They are told by the stars of YouTube that you have to be brash and you have to be loud. They are told that this is the way to success. And if they don't dress in that manner and they don't behave in that manner, then what happens to the person? He starts to feel strange in society. Because why? Because he's different from every, everybody else. He's not having the fancy haircuts. He's not having the tattoos. He's not having two or three girlfriends. He's not following the bands. He's not behaving in a brash manner. So the person starts to feel like, I'm strange. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that this will happen. That Islam began as something strange and it will return as being something strange. So give glad tidings to the strangers. But people who don't attach their hearts to Islam and they don't ponder upon the bounty of Islam, then they will be depressed because they don't fit into society. But if you have given your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you understand how valuable this bounty of Islam is in your heart, what is the state of your heart? What is the state of your mind? Tell me youngsters. If you are connected to Allah, what is the state of your mind? Are you ever going to be depressed? You're going to have this feeling of freedom. You're free. 
Nothing can affect you by the pressures of society. Why? Because who are you trying to please all of the time? Allah. Your mind is focused on Allah all the time. So what if YouTube so-and-so names, I can't even remember their names, are saying you should behave in an X, Y, and Z manner? So what if the fashion gurus are saying you should wear clothing which is so tight that even women can't fit into that clothing and it's supposed to be men's clothing today's day and age? You wouldn't care for these things. You wouldn't care to dye your hair blonde, trying to look strange. But you would only care for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Jal, the Prophet sallallahu told us in the hadith in Ibn Haban, Ibn Hiban, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, where she said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ لِلْتَمَسَ رِضَ اللَّهِ بِسَخْتِ النَّاسِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ وَأَرْضَ عَنْهُ النَّاسِ That whoever seeks the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if, even if it brings about the displeasure of the people, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with him, and he will cause the people to be pleased with him. وَمَنْ إِلْتَمَسَ رِضَ النَّاسِ بِسَخْتِ اللَّهِ سَخْتَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَسْخَتَ عَلَيْهِ النَّاسِ And whoever seeks the pleasure of the people by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by displeasing Allah azawajal, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with him and he will cause the people to be displeased with him. So when you're in Islam and you recognize the bounty that you have, your focus is Allah not the pressures of society. You will never be depressed. You will never be swayed by the majority. You are free because your heart is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the bounties of Allah azawajal. And the Muslim, he should be proud to as much as he can to have a Muslim identity, to look like a Muslim. Because the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith, man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. Whoever resembles a people, then he is considered to be from them. So if you see people not resembling, not looking like Muslims, then who are they from? Are they from the Muslims? No, they're considered to be from the non-Muslims. Not in reality, not saying that they're kuffar whatsoever. No, far from that. But they've chosen not to resemble that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What am I saying here in terms of resembling? Am I saying the brother can't dress like this or like that over there wearing shirts and jeans? Not at all. What do I mean by when I say you should resemble the Muslims? Huh? Character, of course, character is extremely important. But the external resemblance. So behavior and character, that's a given, that's a must. But the brothers who are wearing jeans and t-shirts who seem to be the majority, is this something wrong? Is this something that shouldn't be done? It's allowed to wear any type of clothing as long as Islam allows that. Even if the kuffar wear the same clothing that you wear. If it's clothing which is specifically known to be for them, right? then that's the type of clothing you cannot wear. Like if somebody was to see you wearing a particular type of clothing and they straight away think that this guy's a non-Muslim or he's a gangster of some sort. This person, he's from the streets because of the way he's dressed. Then this type of clothing is absolutely not allowed to wear. But clothing which is generally worn by Muslims and non-Muslims alike, then that's allowed to wear as long as it doesn't break one of the rules of clothing of the Sharia. Like showing your aura being too tight, like having outlandish type of coloring which nobody else wears in the society, okay? So when I'm talking about that you should resemble Muslims, it doesn't mean that you only have to wear clothing that is found in Muslim countries because today in Muslim countries, the clothing is so mixed, okay? Just that's an important point. Taib, another thought, another reflection on this bounty of Islam. Leading on from the previous one that we just mentioned, the influences of society. Many people, they grow up and they have friends who mislead them, take them astray, show them bad ways. And many of the people who are misled, they don't really want to do these evil actions. But it's because of the peer pressure, because of the friends in the society that they're in. The friends mislead them. But in Islam, your friendship is completely different. In Islam, your friends, they don't only come to you because you have money. They don't only come to you because you have the nice car. They don't come to you because you're the guy who everybody thinks is fun. You're the guy who's arranging the parties and the football matches, etc. They don't come to you because you have that popularity. They come to you to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what that means? That's something really special. That means that if you don't see this friend for 10 years, for five years, but then the time you do see him, you're still as though you were brothers. Why? Because that brotherhood that you have with that person is established for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It never goes. The person always remembers you for the sake of Allah, even if you are not with him. The Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim that Allah says on the day of judgment, أَيْنَ الْمُتَّحَابِينَ بِجَلَالِ الْيَوْمَ أَظِلَّهُمْ فِي ذِلِّ يَوْمَ لَا ذِلْ إِلَّا ذِلِّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, where are those who used to love each other for my sake in the world? Today, I will put them in a shade, in my shade, on the day when there is no shade, except for my shade. So the Muslims, they remember this hadith, and a hadith like this. And that's why they treat each other with a respect of friendship and brotherhood that no other society has. Like I said, honestly, you come across some people that they love you for the sake of Allah, and you may not see them for years and years, but when you do see them once again, they're willing to give you whatever you need. They're willing to help you in any way, shape, or form. Why? Because they remember this hadith. They're doing it all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this beautiful relationship, you don't find it except for the, in Islam. You remember when you used to have friends that were non-Islamic, non-practicing. It was all about the dunya. And as, long, as soon as something went wrong in that dunya connection, they would leave you. They would run away from you. But in Islam, it's completely different. Allah gives you this beautiful bounty of having companions who love you for his sake. And they will always be there with you, even if they do not live in the same region as you anymore. Another thought and reflection on the bounty of this beautiful gift that we have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many youngsters and many people in societies, they suffer a lot of heartbreak. They suffer a lot of emotional pain. And one of the reasons they suffer this is because as they go through the school systems, the college system, the university system, there's a lot of free mixing that is taking place. And the society that they live in encourages them that they should experiment with the opposite gender. Every time they watch a movie, the movie is full of quote-unquote romance. And that the accepted person, that the hero always has somebody from the opposite gender. Every time they listen to a rap song, the rap song is showing them that the one who is liked in society is the one that is surrounded by the opposite gender. Even the video games today have these kind of themes. So the youth, they are growing up thinking that this is the way that we're going to find happiness. It's for us to have these relationships with the opposite gender. But what tends to happen, they fall into these relationships, they become emotionally committed, and as the nature of haram, these things stop very quickly. They break up very quickly. So you find that these youngsters and these people who have fallen into these relationships, they fall into depression and heartbreak, and they have a lot to deal with. And they can't come home and tell their parents about it. They can't speak to their family about it. So where do they find solace? They find solace then by turning to drugs, turning to drink, turning to alcohol. All of this, why? Because it came about through illicit and illegal relationships. But in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevents us from that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاهِشَ وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا and do not come close to zina, for verily it is an evil path. What's the amazing thing in this verse that Allah mentions? What did he say? Don't come close to it, right? He didn't say don't fall into it. He said don't even come near it, meaning don't even do the free mixing. Don't even do the looking and the speaking and the intermixing. Stay away from it completely, the opposite gender, and then you will be safe. You won't fall into these evil paths. You won't fall into that heartbreak. You won't fall into that emotional roller coaster that so many of our youth are falling into. So again, from the bounties of Islam, every time you look at any of the teachings of Islam, it's all beneficial. Any topic you think about and you reflect on that, you find that Islam trumps every other way of life. Islam protects you from any type of evil or any type of mistake that a person can fall into. Another thought. Many people today growing up, they're addicted to music. A lot of the youth growing up and even adults are addicted to music. What is music? What do we consider music to be? Is it permissible? It's completely impermissible. Music is impermissible. All forms. Don't tell me classical music sounds like the natural singing of the birds, as some people try to say. No. All forms of music, okay, is forbidden in Islam. And it's considered to be the flute of the shaitan. And you find that the music industry a lot of the rappers, they admit that actually what we portray is not the reality that we live. 
all this bling bling, all this gold and diamonds and amazing cars, we don't own that. We just hire that for the video so we can make money from the gullible people who listen to us. And you find that many of the singers and many of the artists in the music industry, very quickly they fall into drug abuse and alcohol abuse because it's a very evil industry, the music industry. And likewise, listening to music is very evil. And you know what's most evil about it? The evil thing about it is that it takes you away from the Quran. Like Ibn Qayyim said, radiallahu anhu, rahimahullah ta'ala, that the heart of the believer cannot have the, the, the Quran of the shaitan and the Quran of the Rahman at the same time. The more you listen to music, the less you will listen to of the Quran. The more you listen to of the Quran, the less you will listen to of music. So those of us who are addicted to music, those of our youngsters who feel that they can't get away from the music, the reality is that you are not listening to enough of the Quran. Allah says in Surah Yunus, Ya ayyuhal nas, qad ja'atkum maw'idatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur wa hudan wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. O people, there has come to you an admonition from your Lord and a cure for what is in the hearts and guidance and mercy for the believers. This is the Quran. It's a cure for any ailment that you have in your heart. So people said, it's a stress reliever, right? Somebody said that. That's what they claim, that when you're depressed, go and listen to music, it will make you feel good. Allah is telling you that the Quran is the thing which is the cure for you. Leave the music alone and listen to the Quran and you will see how it relaxes you. You will see how it gives you tranquility and you'll see how it gives you guidance. How can that not be the case when these are the words of the one who created everything which is in existence? Who created happiness? Who creates sadness? Who is in control of that? Is it not Allah? So if you spend time listening to the words of Allah, Allah will protect you from sadness. He will take the depression away. and He will increase the happiness for you. He will increase the joy for you in your life. So people who listen to music and are addicted to music, they need to come closer to the Quran. Listen to more of the Quran and they will find more and more happiness in their lives. One more thought and inshallah maybe we'll end with this one. Of how? amazing the bounty of Islam is and how we should reflect on this more often that a lot of people today in our societies they are suffering health issues and in fact there is a health epidemic throughout the world not just mental health issues but physical health issues and you find that Islam has given us through the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the revelation of Allah وجل, so many beneficial instructions which benefit us in the realm of health. For example, in the hadith narrated by Imam Ahmed, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا مَلَأَ آدَمِيٌّ وِيَاءً شَرٌ مِنْ بَطْنِهِ The Prophet ﷺ said that an, the, the human being doesn't fill a vessel which is more evil than his stomach. And he said, بِحَسْبِ ibn Adam, أَكَلَاتٌ يُقِمْنَا صُلْبَهُ It suffices the son of Adam that he takes some morsels which was keep his back straight. That's all you need is a few morsels according to the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he said, فَإِن كَانَ لَا مَحَالَ فَثُلُثٌ لِطَعَامِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِشَرَابِهِ وَثُلُثٌ لِنَفَسِهِ And if it be the case that he needs more than that, he can't resist the third slice of the pizza, then he should ensure that there is a third left in his stomach for drink and then there is a third left for air, for him to breathe. It shouldn't be that it comes up to your throat and you can only roll your way to the masjid, okay? You should have enough in your stomach to be, enable you to walk. So look at this advice of the Prophet ﷺ. What are the doctors talking about today? What are the health gurus talking about today? Fasting, right? So many different types of fasting. What's the, what's the main one at the moment? Intermittent fasting. That's the one that my wife keeps telling me you have to do intermittent fasting. And it's true. The less you eat, the more energetic you feel. The more you're giving times, time for your body to heal itself and to rejuvenate the cells that it requires in the body and so many other benefits your mind becomes sharper so the kuffar they know this but we were given this information century ago 1400 years ago by the prophet ﷺ, a great bounty but where are the people that implement this so we have to as i said in the beginning the more you start to read about islam but not just a surface reading every time you read something in islam think how would my life be without this information how would my life be without this instruction from the Prophet ﷺ? And then you will come to realize how much of a great bounty it is that the Prophet ﷺ has given us. So the point I was trying to drive home is that we should always compare and we should always 
understand that how blessed we are to have this bounty of Islam from Allah Azza wa Jal. Many of the companions, radiyallahu anhum, they lived in a time which we can say is a bit similar to our time in the sense that there was a lot of, a lot of Islamophobia in their time. And you know today, Muslims are finding it hard to raise their heads proudly and to say that yes, we are Muslims and this is what believe, we believe, X, Y, and Z. The Sahaba, they had these issues, but they had them worse. For example, in Tirmidhi, there's a narration that the Mushrikeen, they came to Salman al-Farsi, radiyallahu anhu, and they started to make fun of him. They said, your Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa even teaches you how to go to the bathroom? Yani, what kind of religion is this that you have instruction of how to go to the bathroom, talking about those issues? What did Salman do? Salman said, yes, with a big smile on his face and so happy. And he started to teach them. He said, the Prophet Sallallahu told us that when we go to the bathroom, we should say this dua, we should enter with this foot, we should not use our right hands for cleaning ourselves. Look how proud they were of their religion. Why? Because they would reflect all the time and they knew for sure that this bounty that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has given them is not compar comparable to any other way of life on the dunya. So they would never shy away from their deen. And this is the point that we need to reach to. We need to understand that this bounty that Allah has given us, we can never find anything similar to that elsewhere in this dunya. And if we reach that conclusion, then nobody can make us feel shy of being a Muslim. Nobody can make us feel inferior in any way, shape or form. One question I forgot to ask you. I mentioned the hadith about the brotherhood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will say on the day of judgment, on this day, I will enter those people who loved each other for my sake in my shade. On the day when there is no shade except for my shade. What does it mean the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That this is rather a shade that Allah creates for his slaves that he will give that shade to, to be saved from the punishment of the heat of the sun. But there is nothing, there is no sun above the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it is a shade created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah knows best. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he increase us in knowledge and he increase us in practice. Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you have any questions, feel free. If you have any uh, corrections, then feel free. Wa jazakumullah khair.